Jarin had worked at a recruiting firm since he'd graduated second school, for ten years now, and still loved his job as much as he did the day he started. His species, Natty, were insectoid, and had been in the Galactic Union for less than 100 years, but were considered to be great contributors. The best part of Jaren's contribution, he felt, was that he didn't just work for Natty. He worked for dozens of species, finding the perfect employee for companies all across the galaxy. At the moment, Jaren was absolutely exhausted because he had been sitting at his desk at all night and was startled when he saw the sun was rising. But he was only just starting to feel it, flooded with endorphins. A light flicked on over his co-worker's name, on the small dashboard across his desk, which meant Hinor had arrived at work. Jaren didn't hesitate before pressing the button to call him over the intercom. You're in early, Hinor remarked. I never left, Jaren exclaimed. You... for Void's sake, why? The human job fair the city had yesterday? I did further research into their home planet and their species. This is the most exciting species to join the Union in forever. Hinor chittered in annoyance. You're going crazy over them too? This is ridiculous. Vinter wouldn't shut up about it, texting me all evening. I know they passed several tests that Kali Mana had at the fair with flying colours, but this seems... No, no, you don't understand, Jaren interrupted. Nothing about the job fair was out of the ordinary. Every species has something wonderful to contribute. There's always fascination with learning all about them. But that isn't what kept me researching all night. I was curious about how much variety they had in appearance. That's what first led me down this path. A shuffling sounded on the other end of the line, as his friend situated himself in his chair and turned on his workstation. Yeah, I noticed that too. The more I looked and compared one to others besides them, the more I saw significant differences. Not just colours, but the colour of their fur. How much fur they had, height, weight, other things. It was curious. That was curious. What I found was fascinating. Humans at the job fair were probably as short as 5 feet and tall as 7 feet. But did you know there was a whole subset of humans that averages a height of 4 feet tall? There was a long pause. Wait, so... Not children? No, it's a genetic condition known as... Wait a minute. He scrolled for his notes. Achondroplasia. They're average in every other way in regards to weight, same variety of colours as other humans, etc. But they're the height of a typical metri. That's... That could be immensely useful, Hiro mused. Metri struggle to find crew that can work on their ship because of their size. You're right, this is important information. Jaren chittered excitedly. Oh, I'm just getting started. I told you I was here all night, Hinor, and there's good reason. Wow, okay. Keep going. There are hundreds of thousands of humans who lack a sense that the rest of them have. Sense of sight, sense of hearing, sense of smell. But even those who can't see, they lead completely typical lives. Independent lives. They have jobs. They achieve astonishing things. Wait, wait, wait. They haven't cured these issues? Hiddor asked, baffled. By and large, yes. They've made huge strides scientifically, but their brains are immensely complex, Jaren explained. Maybe in another two or three hundred years they'll make further strides, but that's assuming they want to. The strangest thing is that they don't consider this a priority. They are busy with other things, thinking if these humans can live fulfilling lives, those who can't should take priority. They... Okay, hold on. Let me pull up a fresh document to take notes. This is a lot. Hinner interrupted. Jerim paused, his eyes flicking over the last article he'd been reading before his co-worker had arrived. Alright, so they didn't make any attempt to reduce the amount born with those disabilities? Those who couldn't see, for example and knew they might have children who couldn't see. They live perfectly wonderful lives, you have to understand. Horrible genetic diseases that would result in a child that could not lead a happy life, or were often subject to an early, horrible death, 
Of course they hesitated to procreate in those cases. But not here. Humans implemented simple things across the planet. The littlest things, like bumps on the ground to indicate they've arrived at a street corner, and beeping to alert that ground vehicles had stopped and it is safe to walk. That sounds technically dangerous, but alright, Hinnor muttered. Jorin twitched and fidgeted with his forelimbs. Those who can't hear speak with hand movements, like underwater sentience, and those who can't smell, well, that's disappointing, but hardly a crippling disability. But humans who can't see? Hinnor, there is no other species who can work for the Tikkin. They don't have the proprioception and skills to manage it. But these humans could. And those who cannot smell? Well, he chuckled. There is good reason the Vin Nag have trouble finding employees. And we have suddenly been presented with the solution. The clicks and beeps of Hinnor at his workstation echoed over the speakers. Incredible. This is... Well, if I'd been sitting beside you, I also likely would have gotten not a moment of rest last night. You do know that you have to go home once we're done with this conversation, though, right? And I put good dolls on you falling asleep and missing your stop on the train home. Jaren chuckled. Quite likely. There are more things like this. I'll send you everything I've found. But the most wonderful subset I've found are going to be visiting in droves. And I bet you my third arm will have scores moving here to Ulmani. There are humans that would prefer our planet over their own. How could that be? They joke about feeling like aliens on their own planet all the time. Characteristics they have set them apart from average humans. And I know that you learned what humans are like from our experience yesterday. There are numerous things that vary from one to another in degree, but they are all in this subset, across a continuum. Listen to the most common ones. Preference for avoiding eye contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact, and they often speak less. Some of them don't even speak at all. Selective or complete mutism. Preferring alone time or small groups over large ones and hating loud noises. Enjoying repetitive tasks. Finding obligatory social experiences unenjoyable. Much preferring meaningful conversations about subjects they are passionate about. And they struggle with conversing, with sarcasm, with humour. You know how we must navigate conversations carefully because, if we don't imply subtext, the species we're speaking with might fill in subtext that doesn't exist? That's a huge frustration for these humans. They even perform repetitive movements to occupy their minds. Like my preference for forelimb scratching and your enjoyment of tapping your tarsa. It's called autism. Jerem felt silent to allow Hinor to reply, and there was a long silence. My goodness he finally said, quietly. So many things about humans are different. I'm excited to meet people with autism, but even more so to learn about everything that they didn't just think were broken and try to fix. They're so diverse. Their cultural impact is going to be massive. Jaren flicked from one screen to another on his workstation. I'm sending you everything I've found so far, and I'm going to call the human ambassador. We need them to understand how the galaxy is going to see them. Absolutely, Hinnor agreed, and there is no chance we're the only ones who have realised what this means. I'm going to scour their galactic job websites, make posts for all of these subsects of humans. I'll be sending out more emails to that planet than ever before for a first contact outreach. Get lots of rest, because this week is going to be the busiest week we've ever had.